Hey guys, welcome back. Another episode of the Rush Hour. Joined today by an old friend of mine and a longtime pitcher in the big leagues, Rich Hill, along with our other buddy, Rob Friedman, the pitching ninja, is here to join us and uh, co host today. So we got quite an interview in front of us. So hope you guys enjoy and looking forward to it. Rich, how are you, man? Hey, Glendon. Thanks for having me on. Well, really excited welcome. to be on. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad you're here. Rob, how are you doing? I'm doing great, man. Good, good, good to have you, and uh, we always love all your your info and input, and uh, everything you put out on uh, social media is always fun to check out. And I know I found out now that I, I finally got a hold of Rich since he doesn't have a Twitter account, but he does keep track of you on Instagram, so he knows what's going on. Oh, so you know, I was going to ask if he knew who who the heck I was. He does. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I really enjoy uh, all your stuff on on uh, Instagram. Yeah, I'm not on Twitter. I've uh, just got off the uh, uh, dial up internet actually here at the house. So now that we have <laughs> Wi Fi, um, we should span, uh, spanning my horizons. We should make that a uh, maybe that's a task today. We sign you up for Twitter. Uh, <laughs> you can just do a <laughs> yeah, lot. <laughs> I need to do that. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. You'd have. I'm sure people would have a blast with you. Um, yeah. So let's let's start with uh, take me back to Little Rich Hill. One of the fascinating stories we've we've heard about and talked about, and I I don't know if I've ever even sat down and gone over this story with you about how you kind of shifted from being a righty to a lefty when you're a kid. Yeah, I mean, you know, with with our son now, Bryce, who is uh, who is nine years old. He just turned nine about a week ago. Um, watching him you know, uh, grow up and, and now or get to the stage that he's at right now. Um, I thought back to about the time when I was five or six and, uh, you know, throwing left-handed up until that point. And then right around five or six years old, I started, uh, excuse me, throwing right-handed and then started through my brother took me in the backyard and started, you know, working with me to throw left-handed. So that's kind of how it, how it went and, uh, continued to, uh, you know, shoot pucks and swing a bat left-handed and everything else I do is right-handed though. You didn't break your arm like Billy Wagner did and have to. Have to no, I it. wish. I'd throw <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. Cause you always, you always hear the more of the stories of golf. Everybody always gives the old story of, Oh, I play golf right-handed because they didn't have any left-handed clubs. And, but yeah, yeah. your, your yeah. bro takes you out and here you are left-handed 40, 40 years old, still pitching in the big league. So pretty, yeah. pretty nice work. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's um, well, you, you taught me a lot coming up. That was uh, something that I was fortunate to have you and, and Dempster and, and Maddox and Latroy Hawkins and a bunch of really great guys in that Cubs locker room when I was when I was, you know, didn't know how to put my shoes on. So <laughs> yeah, we had a we had a great crew. So in in uh, like uh, youth age, were you were you you were playing hockey? Were you playing basketball, football, anything else other than baseball? Yeah, I played basketball. I played. Uh, I played a little. I played more. The hockey was more like pond hockey and street hockey. But I was uh, geared in, in basketball and baseball, and then played soccer uh, during the fall. So fall sport was soccer. Uh, winter sport was was basketball, and then and then baseball in the in the spring and in, in the summer. Interesting. So, what parts of that do you think are transferable to to pitching, or do, or is any of it? I mean, it's just being a good athlete. Yeah. That's a great question. I think, uh, you know, I think a lot of it, I, it, what, what we're, what I'm in, encouraging our son to do is, is to uh, play, play as many sports as he wants um, and, and find out what he enjoys and, and go from there. I think, you know, we're, we're kind of in a stage right now of, of uh, not to get off of the question, but to uh, see more of the professionalization of amateur sports and seeing, uh, you know, especially and, and I notice it a lot here in Massachusetts now we're in the northeast where you know hockey is very popular but baseball you know now is uh, as and 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 in regards to hockey that has almost you know really become a full full year uh sport up here in, in Massachusetts and also uh, I'm starting to so what what kind of tipped me off to it was coming back home in the off seasons and little by little you would see kids playing fall ball and then now it went from fall ball to okay there's an indoor league and then from the indoor league in the winter they just go right into spring baseball now you know you're you're expecting i mean in my opinion i think it's a lot for for a young kid to 
to be able to be asked to, no matter how much they love it, um, I think it, it's valuable to play other sports and get away from, you know, the, the repetition of doing one thing over and over again. Um, because again, I mean, you, you don't know, you might find something else that, that you really love and, and that you're good at. Um, and you won't find out unless you, you go and try those, those other sports. So I think that, yes, you know, with, in regards to the conditioning from basketball, or the conditioning from, you know, soccer, even when I was younger, but also just the coordination, the body coordination, the, the ability to be able to understand where your body is in space and how valuable that is in, in other sports, especially in pitching, um, because you're kind of going from, you know, a static position to making a, you know, uh, a reaction or, or making a motion moving towards the plate. And it, cre it, it, it has to do with a lot of, um, you know, body control and strength and understanding how your body moves in space. Well, I mean, you, you definitely, uh, your follow through is unique. And I wonder how much of that comes from playing other sports. I mean, you look springy, you have that uh, hop, the hill hop yeah. that we call it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, well, I think, you know, I think that's kind of, uh, developed over time. I think it's something that, um, you know, I, I, I was thinking about this the other day, and I don't know how the question really was uh, phrased to, it was actually for someone else, but it was like, when did you realize that you were going to be, you know, A or B or whatever the fill in the blank. And for me, it was like, when did you realize you were going to be a major league pitcher? And it's an interesting question because I think it's, um, you know, something for me, I would say 35. <laughs> Right. So it's, it's, it's like, okay, well, you didn't, yes, I knew I was going to be a major league pitcher coming up through the minor leagues and, and also have the opportunity to get drafted because I had the talent in high school and in, in college. Um, but really truly understanding that, that you had, you know, the ability to have success in the game, probably I would say 35 when I went back to independent ball and really understood, you know, what, um, it took, you know, took from me, not from, you know, uh, looking at anyone else or understanding what everybody else was good at, it, what I was really good at, and then taking that and, and um, pole vaulting it into the, into the big leagues. Um, you know, but I did have that when I was younger. It just came in flashes. It would come in flashes. It never really was sustainable and understanding why it was sustainable until I was, until I was older. So, yeah, I think the, the leg kick – um, you know, is, is something that kind of was manifested over um, time and through kind of that intensity and aggressiveness that I love to talk about a lot. That, that, that's really interesting because it goes back to your youth baseball uh, stuff that you're talking about that we're expecting kids to, to know what they want to do really early. And you're saying at 35, you finally <laughs> figured out that at, at yeah. how to, um, everybody develops kind of differently. Yeah. And I, and I, encourage a lot of uh parents you know and i see it i think maybe you know we've all seen it is that the practice starts and maybe you're talking to a parent or something like that and then all of a sudden the focus becomes you know where the the conversation isn't about the, your son or daughter or or whoever is out there on the on the ice the court the field um having fun it becomes more of this you know intense focus on mistakes and looking at picking out all the mistakes that they're making as opposed to look at the smile on their face, look at the fun that they're having. You know, I think that's something that uh, goes, goes definitely missed um, in the, in the early, early on uh, go early going with, with, uh, with kids. And I, and I see it as a parent for the first time kind of going through this and I'm just like, wow, I don't see any of the scouts in the stands or the Bruins <laughs> coming by today. I'm not sure. <laughs> but, if, if you look at, if you look at um, the developmental stages from, I know it was for me. I got better yeah. as I got older and the more experience you get and the more knowledge you take in and hopefully you're able to gain confidence along the way. And it's not just, um, you know, Hey, I'm getting better because I'm getting older. It's, it's really all those things put together that help you get to the next level. And for you, it took probably longer than most guys, but you mm -hmm. know, you have some injuries along the way and everything else, but it's so fun to look back. And, and I think that's such encouraging words for, any pitcher at any level to go back and go, Hey, 
I can get better. And, and if I just keep working at it, keep working at it, eventually it clicks um, for a lot of guys and, and they can become real good. Yeah. I, I, I really think that, you know, it, it's, it's up to the individual and uh, you know, we all have to make that choice to continue to say, yes, I want to keep going. Yes. I will go play here. I'll go play there. I don't care. Where's there a game? Um, you know, uh, give me, you know, as long as there's an opportunity out there to go and, and pitch or, you know, play or hit or play the field or whatever it might be, or just be on that team. Um, that was something that I learned going through, you know, being out of baseball to getting an opportunity to play, um, you know, in, in independent ball and then kind of, you know, revitalizing my career again as a starter after, you know, going through a shoulder surgery and then going into a, into the bullpen and, and, and having, you know, elbow surgery for the first time. Um, I think that's, it's just all about, you know, knocking down the walls that are going to be in front of you and continuously um, chasing after, after your dream. And, uh, you know, and that kind of changes too along the way. It's like, okay, you had the dream of, you know, playing in the big leagues. Okay. Now, now you want to make a career out of it and you want to win a world series. You want to, you know, you want to continuously push for, for that next, for that next level. Um, you know, I think when, when I think back to 2010, when I made a, a change to go into the bullpen, you know, it was, it was surely out of survival. It was out of, you know, necessity. It was like, okay, I'm not going to get the opportunity to start in AAA. However, I can drop down and I know that I can get left-handed hitters out. And I know that there's a need for that in baseball. Um, you know, and, and, and I started doing that and, you know, showed, had, had some promise in it. And uh, I honestly was, 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 you know, all in on it and thought that that was going to be, uh, you know, the rest of my career or, or whatever I could get out of it uh, was going to be out of the bullpen. Interesting. So going back in, in high school, uh, what was your high school career like? Were you, was everybody looking at you going, that guy's going to make it? Um, who gave you, who mentored you, who helped you uh, get through those years and, and improve? Yeah, I, you know, I think um, in high school, I was a better hitter, I think, than I was a pitcher. I, I, had, I had the ability to spin the baseball. And that's another interesting topic, you know, whether you, you, you know, guys have the ability to spin it or, or, you know, can it be developed? Um, but moving through, you know, high school and, and getting the opportunity to uh, go to college, I was actually recruited off of a VHS. Um, so for the kids out there who don't know what a VHS is, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I was recruited off a of videotape and um, you know, my brother had shot the video uh, put a couple different things out there that were, you know, just a couple games of mine, sent it around and, and, uh, sent it to the university of Michigan and, uh, was, was went out there for a recruiting trip. They offered me a scholarship and, and that's where, that's where I ended up. But, um, you know, through high school, I would say I was, I was a better hitter than I was actually, you know, making an all-star team or whatever it might be in, in your, uh, in your, whatever it is, your county, um, or your town, you know, your, your teams, uh, what would you call it there? Your, uh, oh, the, the, the travel the, ball teams or the uh, uh, travel the ball or, or even high school, you know, that, that was making uh, regional teams, teams and stuff and like yeah, that. Right, right. Yeah. Because of hitting, yeah. it wasn't really, you know, so much because of pitching. Um, but as I, you know, as I got to, you know, later year or senior year, then, then pitching became a little bit more predominant. So, um, yeah, but they yeah hid, I mean, they hid you in the American League for a little while. And like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you, uh, so you were you got drafted three times, right? Three, yeah, three times. Cincinnati the first time, uh, Anaheim, and then and then the the Cubs. Yeah, Cubby. yeah, yeah. So, then, uh, yeah. so then you work your way up the Cubs system, and and that's when I was there, and yeah, and, um, look down and say, hey, this guy. Rich Hill is dominating in double A, then dominating in triple A. And then 05, you come up, make your debut. Uh, I think pitched an inning or something out of the pen. Yeah. Your first one. But then the game, the, the, the great game that we were talking about kind of yeah. before this is yeah. uh, Carlos Zambrano goes up and uh, gives up a snowman. I don't even know yeah. how he was in our rotation, honestly, but. Yeah, I'm just kidding. But. Yeah, I was like, I was like what? <laughs> Wait, what? So, so he goes out and, and gives it up, and, and you come in and go like, I don't know whether you – you went four-plus, scoreless, yeah. dominated, and you got to get your first A-B in the big league. So tell us about that. Tell yeah, us about so, your first couple A-Bs. 
Yeah, it was the first two. Yeah, the first two. Uh, so I remember, I remember uh, going over to you and asking you uh, for for uh, for a bat. Or actually, I don't even know if I asked you. I think you were. You just said, "Here, use this," and you gave me your bat, the B three forty five. I remember yes. Louisville Slugger. It said Glendon Rush on it. I was like, "Oh, this is great, <laughs> beautiful, so well balanced." Uh, I went up there, had a perfectly brand new bat in my hand. I go up there. Doug Davis is pitching. And I'm walking back to the plate after back to the dugout after three three or four pitches, and I said, "Wow, thanks for letting me use your bat." You go, "Yeah, don't." You go, "Next time, try swinging it." <laughs> <laughs> so the next time, uh, I got, I was fortunate. I got another at bat, and I remember I think it was either the first or second pitch. I hit a ground ball, a hard ground ball to a shortstop, but with my uh, Ichiro like speed, I was able to leg it out for a single. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. I mean, what a great story. I love hearing those old, uh, I mean, the, the fact that you were using my bat and then, and off Doug Davis, you know, I, I, uh, I interviewed Randy jo Johnson recently and his first and only major league home run was off Doug Davis. So you guys dominated him together. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's great. Um, so Chicago Cub years, yeah. things go well. You guys make a playoff appearance in 07. Unfortunately, I wasn't there with you. What was it like playing with Lou Pinella? Yeah, Lou was Did he great. ever know your name by the end of the season? Did he know who you were? Yeah, I think so the first year. And then the set, uh, what was it, 08? I didn't pitch so well. So he's like, all right, kid. <laughs> uh, you're going back to the to the triple A level. So yeah, it was it was good. It was, you know, I think throughout all the years that I've been playing and and go through the the managers that I've had and and uh it's been it's been pretty uh the you know the full gamut of 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 managers from you know Lou Dusty to Tito to you know Dave Roberts and even now you know Kevin Cash was our bullpen manager in Cleveland so and then I got an opportunity to play with Kevin when we were in uh when we were in uh Boston together so you know had a had a full range of of a lot of uh great managers and and uh but Lou definitely you know th those unfortunately I don't know if we'll ever see any of the great uh, you know getting tossed those those moments of him getting tossed to, by the umpires I think I hope those days aren't over I hope there's a few more out there that will you know throw a base or you know kick some dirt or something <laughs> those are great yeah we need that character in the game. Yeah. So coming up, who was the biggest? Uh, so did what? What uh, personalities do you respond best to individually? You and then who do you think was most influential in in your career? Because I know everybody kind of takes. Some people can be pushed. Other people have to be encouraged. Uh, what type of things helped you the most? Well, you know. Rob, like just having so many ups and downs throughout my career, um, you know, obviously I'm not just saying it because, you know, on the show, but with Glendon, you know, the first, I remember my first year or getting called up in the big leagues, just talking with him in the outfield and, uh, you know, just going over certain things that, you know, failures that you might be going through, things that you don't even, you know, that don't even now, it, you don't even think about, but when you're a rookie, you're thinking about everything, you know, everything's on the table. So you, you, all these preconceived uh, things about, you know, if I have a bad game, I'm getting sent down, you know, I got to, you know, pitch well and all, all things that are a lot of things that are, you know, are, I laugh at now, but at the time and, and for guys that I've talked to younger guys that are coming up, it's, it's very, uh, it's very real. And, um, yeah, so I think it's a lot of it for me was just going through the ups and downs and the failures, and uh, again having a good group of guys when I when I first came up and in in Demp and and Glendon and Latroy uh, Maddox, uh, those guys, you know, uh, Michael Barrett having a having a guy behind the plate that you know we would go and eat breakfast during um, during spring training together, and and that really for me as as a as a young guy helped me you know, feel like I belonged on the team. And that was something that, uh, that was, that was really beneficial for me. Um, and, you know, I think looking back when I think about going to independent ball and having, you know, this third act, so to speak in, in the game, uh, helped me out greatly. So, uh, you know, I, again, a lot of things through my career have, have, uh, you know, taught me and, and pushed me and, and now, 
you know, with my family, my wife, Caitlin, and, and our son, Bryce, um, you know, she's been, she's been amazing this entire time throughout, throughout all these ups and downs and encouraging me to, um, you know, stay within what I do best and, and, and not abandon, you know, yourself and, uh, continue to put in the work and the, and the time and, and, you know, all of that will lead to, uh, success in, in something. It might not be baseball, but if you have that same work ethic, you have that same mindset, uh, you apply yourself to uh, what it, whatever it is that you're, whatever it is that you're going for, you're going to be, you know, you'll be successful. So one of those things, and, and, and actually what you just said just struck something to me, because people, people respond, you know, I tweet out a lot of pictures, I put a lot of video out there. Yeah. And for some reason, everybody latches on to you. And I think it is partly due to you, your competitiveness kind of comes through just even watching you in videos, like not being in a clubhouse yeah. with you. They can see that. Um, do you ever like, how much did that play into your eventual success? Do you ever have a hard time tempering that? Or am I just reading stuff into video that I don't even see and that other people don't see? And we're just making that up. No. <laughs> so uh, that's a great question. One of the guys that uh, actually helped me out a ton. Um, well, one, uh, I remember going back to the Cub days and talking with Harvey Dorfman. Uh, now, Harvey, Harvey Dorfman was a great, you know, yep. uh, mental coach for for baseball players um, and probably specifically pitchers, I would say. Uh, but, you know, he was he was incredible with with the Oakland Athletics and then um, kind of uh, you know, did his own thing, I think, uh, you know, eventually when he moved on from Oakland, but he was incredible talking with him. Uh, the other guy that was, that was, you know, very instrumental for me personally was Bob Tewksbury. And, you know, he, uh, really laid out just incredible, um, kind of plans for me to, uh, follow and bring that inner, you know, kind of, you know, inner, uh, competitor, out of me and i think that's something that everybody has inside of them it's just again to your to your point of you know do you need a pat on the back do you need to get pushed um i think in the beginning everybody needs something but then eventually you know you have to figure it out on your own you're going through this journey on your own you have to be able to find out what it is that makes you um you know tick um and that that for me when i go out there and and i pitch i pitch as a it's the last time that I'm going to be able to play. Um, and, you know, whether, whatever the results are good or bad, it has no bearing on, you know, how I'm going to uh, attack the hitter or perform on that day, because I'm not concerned about that. My, my mind is solely on the moment and focused in on the, the task at hand or that pitch um, that I'm throwing and executing that pitch to the best of my ability. So, you know, really, um, removing yourself from all those other kind of uh, outside thoughts that you might have, you know, the umpire, the play that didn't get made or got made or the walk that happened or the home run or whatever, all those, you know, basically fall to the, to the fact of the moment and, and your ability to go out there and, and attack. And when you have that mindset, whether you picture, you know, an animal or a certain type of, uh, I don't know. That's probably the best example I could give. It's just a, it, just an animal that you can think of that is in attack mode, or you know, this intensity that 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 uh, they they have, and you can see that. That is that is what you know. I want to bring when I go out there and pitch, and I can. At the end of the day, yes, I want to win, but if the ball comes out of my hand as many times as I want, you know, out of a hundred, or you know, pick a number. Uh, I know I can, you know, as the, as the year goes on or as that, as that game goes on, the more times I do that, the more successful I'm going to be. What animal is it? For me? Oh man. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. There's been a couple, but <laughs> squirrel. <laughs> I, yeah. yeah. Mean squirrel. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah, I, Kill yeah, a rat. Mean squirrel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I so think, every, yeah, every, every guy, yeah. every guy has really in their career, most guys have, more than one act, right? It's, it's a, yeah. you know, you go through the ups and downs and you recover and you go on to the next chapter and you've had multiple, as you said, I've never shared this story with anybody, but in 2015, 
you called me and I was riding on a bus in Lake yeah. Elsinore, pitching coach in the Padres organization. And you're like, Hey, I need a job. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, <laughs> isn't, isn't Mark Pryor the pitching coordinator there? I said, yes, absolutely. Let me call him. And so, yeah. and, and at that point in time, you were at a point in your career where you were willing to do anything. And, and at how old exactly were you that year? Was that you were, you were, uh, 30, 35, 30, 35, right? So yeah. At 35 years old, I had already retired when I, I think I stopped at 33 or 34, but at 35 years old, you were willing to do anything it took to still pitch and to still perform at the highest level, which if there's any other lesson you can learn from listening to this interview for you kids out there, youth guys, whatever, I mean, to, to be able to do that, to suck up all your pride and go, I'm going to go to independent ball. And I'm not there just because I just want to play baseball anymore. I'm there because I want to get back and perform at the highest level eventually win a world series and, and do everything I can at, at, at the uh, major league level. So no, kudos to you, man. I, what yeah. a cool, what a cool journey you've had. And the fact that you're still doing it is incredible. So after all that, you end up with the Dodgers Yeah. and, and four years in a row, you end up in the playoffs. Yeah. Two yeah. world series appearances. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, you yeah. couldn't, you couldn't ask for a better second half of your script than, than you've had so far. Right. Yeah. And I, you know, going back to 2015, I think I exhausted every uh, number in my, in my book. I was calling everybody. I said, I think Michael Barrett's over here. Okay. Glennon's here. I'm like, oh, I called everybody. I mean, yeah, but to your point, it's just uh, understanding and being, being, uh, you know, people I, in, I think um, I was, I forget who I was talking to. I was talking to somebody that they were saying like, you know, you have to let everybody else know that you still want to pitch. Um, and I was kind of like shot, you know, it took me back a little bit, but it was a learning moment that again, to, to what you were saying is that how bad do you want it? You will do, you know, exhaust all of your, all of your contacts, exhaust all of your possibilities. And, and if, if you're genuine about what it is that you want to go after, people can hear that they can see that. And, and that resonates with them because they want that, that real, you know, that real person, they don't want somebody who's, you know, just, you know, doing it because it's something to do, or, you know, they think it, whatever, whatever other, uh, you know, false idea that, that you might have about, you know, or, or going about what it is that you are passionate about, people will see that, and they will see if you are genuine about it. So that was something that, you know, I, I, you know, resonated with me, and it was a huge learning moment, um, moving forward, especially, you know, at 35, we're all, I'm continuously learning, you know, as I, I'm sure we all are, but as, as I'm getting older, I'm learning more and more about, you know, just, uh, different little, little things about life. So, um, yeah. So going forward to the Dodgers, uh, it was, uh, just, a, it's, it was a great four years there and, uh, being fortunate to be able to have a couple opportunities to go to the world series, um, was amazing, uh, you know, pitching on the biggest stage and, and having an opportunity to uh, be able to, you know, get a chance to win a World Series was something uh, that I'm looking forward to again, hopefully, hopefully next year. So that was, you know, something great, great teams that we had um, in LA. And obviously, you know, right now they're in the World Series again with most of those guys. And, and it looks like they're going to, you know, probably wrap it up this year and, and win that ring. But, um, you know, it's, it's an incredibly talented group. And, uh, you know, I was, I was fortunate to be a part of it. You, you had mentioned Maddox as an influence, and obviously you pitched alongside Kershaw. Uh, what, what did you see in both of those guys that, that stood out to you? What, what, what elevated them to the next level? They're, they're not – I mean, to me, outwardly, they don't look that similar. I was wondering if there's a common thread and what differences there are in, in, in each of their games. Yeah. I, you know, I think um, if you just take the sheer, the pitch ability for both is, is off the charts. Um, but the ability to uh, manipulate pitches, I think, um, you know, if you look at, if you look at Greg, I think he would probably be a little bit more, um, you know, the, the ball would roll towards that side of the court for him. Um, the intensity and, and just the overall aggressiveness and not saying that, you know, he, Greg had the aggressiveness and all of that with every, every pitch that he threw. Um, it's just, 
I think with Clayton, it was, it's more, you know, here it is, hit it, here it is, hit it. I'm going to throw my best slider and uh, you, I'm going to make you, uh, you know, swing the bat and, and make contact and bad contact the way that I want, the way that I want uh, you to, to do it. So, and I, and, and again, same with, same with Greg, but I think it was, you know, with Clayton, um, just being being around him and and seeing his work ethic and his ability to uh almost will will things to happen um is 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 pretty impressive uh you know he i think it was a couple of years ago he hurt his back in the first inning and he pitched i think another five innings after that first inning and his fastball didn't go over 86 miles an hour and you know he ends up winning the game uh and but it was just the, the point of that is just the, the sheer determination of saying like, okay, I don't, you know, if, if I don't have my best stuff or, you know, I'm going not just, you know, I'm going to will my way to, to win and, and continue to keep fighting. Um, you know, and I saw that, saw that in Maddox, but it was towards the end of his career. And I think I saw a lot more polish on every single pitch and it was just, you know, obviously the guy knew exactly what he was all about, what he did best. Both of them do. That's, that's both of them know what they do best and they, they don't, you know, really, you know, veer off of that at all. And I think that's a, that's, you know, a pretty common theme with, with a lot of major league pitchers who have, who have been able to, um, you know, play, play in the big leagues for, for some time that they know what they do best and they don't, they don't veer from that. But, you know, those two guys in particular just did it better than everyone else. <laughs> Any good practical jokes that Maddox played? Because I know he was known as a... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Glennon. <laughs> you got to have something. I don't know if there's any on the air. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, yeah. No, he had some great ones. So I, I think the one that, um, that, that people laugh at the hardest when I tell the story is um, uh, when he kept the chart, when he was charting uh, the day before he pitched, he would record farts. And so at the bottom, <laughs> at the bottom of his chart, <laughs> there, there, was, there was your initials with yeah. tallies and he would record all the farts that were, that were um, uh, audible from pitch one to the last pitch of the game. And so, and it yeah. included, uh, clubhouse staff, um, coaches, uh, trainers, it included everybody. So that was always oh, a good, yeah. the fart, the Maddox fart game was, was always fun to be a part of. Yeah. Or getting the occasional booger wiped on you. <laughs> uh, yeah, he was solid so um changing arm angles you 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 touched on it a little yeah. bit here and and i i that hit home with me because i did it in high school and and it started out as kind of goofing around hey i'm gonna throw some sidearm pitches but it was really easy for me to do and so i did it all the way through high school and then I get drafted and I show up in the minor leagues. And my first pitching coach says, what are you doing that for? Why are you dropping? Yeah. Why are you dropping down there? What are you doing that yeah. for? And fortunately the following year, I had a left-handed pitcher, uh, Tom Bergmeier in the Royals organization that pitched in the big leagues for 17 years. And he dropped down. And so he was like, absolutely. You should be dropping down. That's yeah. another way to get guys out. And yes, and yes, and yes. And so I ended up doing it my whole career. But I mean, for you, not only did you, you did it to kind of reinvent yourself as a reliever against lefties, but then it became a full weapon all the time as a starter too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. I, you know, um, even back in the Cub days, you know, I, you guys like, you know, thinking about Barry Bonds or King Griffey Jr. Or, you know, Adam Dunn, just bigger, bigger left-handed hitters uh, that were, you know, had big long swings and just to mix it up, just, you know, to drop down every now and then, but then, you know, moving into a full-time reliever role, I felt like that was the only kind of way that I could, uh, you know, again, survive as a lefty. And, and after I had shoulder surgery in 2009 and it hurt to go back over the top uh, for probably, you know, two years. Um, and, you know, funny story, I guess, I was telling Mickey Calloway when we were in Cleveland um, and we were going into 2013, we were going into the playoffs, the wild card game. And we had like a workout day and, uh, you know, it was my turn to pitch. I was going to throw two innings. Uh, I went out there and I threw over the top and after I, and I don't know why, again, it was like, you know, I just felt like doing it on that day. And I was like, yeah, I feel good. I'm going to do it. And after I was done, I told Mickey, I was like, you know, I think I could start again. 
and uh, he was kind of like, well, and then, you know, a couple of years later, I see him, he's like, I, I should have listened to you. <laughs> you <know? laughs> but going now, now doing it, it just, it feels like it's, uh, again, one of the, one of the, one of the best words that I, that I love to use and I, and I encourage everybody to do this is creativity. Um, so it's, it's just being able to, you know, take a ball and say, okay, I'm going to try this. I'm going to try that. I'm going to try I'm going to try a, a myriad of, of arm angles and see what I feel comfortable with. Now, I'm not saying to go out there and, and exhaust yourself by, you know, forcing something that doesn't feel natural. But if it feels natural, I mean, I, I encourage, you know, everybody to try to, um, you know, be creative with their ability to throw a baseball. So anything that you can do um, to create a new look or a different angle or a different shape, of a pitch and it doesn't always have to be a curveball. It can be a change up slider, even your fastball. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's something that has benefited myself and, and I encourage a lot of, a lot of kids and, and other players. I, you know, I've talked to guys, I, you know, I don't know if I got him to do it, but he, he did it a couple of times and, and was Clayton, uh, you know, being able to see him drop down and, and try to spin a breaking ball from down there or see his fastball come out a little bit harder actually, which was funny. Um, but you know, yeah, I, I encourage everybody to do it because I think it's just another weapon that you can have in, in the arsenal and um, you know, it, it doesn't hurt to try. Yeah. That's a really interesting point because I think it seems like pitching has gone through and as I mean, I coach kids too. And, yeah. and it went from just pure, you talk about pitching mechanics. Everybody's got to move like a robot. These are the positions you get in yeah. to now allowing more creativity and athleticism back yeah. into the game. Um, and I think that's a really good, good message because I think we went too far in terms of you have to get to this position. You have to do this. Yeah. Uh, versus a lot. I, I know you mess with timing sometimes too, where, yes, where you yeah. throw a hitter off. Um, and I think those are all important methods of, uh, I don't know why you only have to do it through spin or velocity. Right. Why can't you do that stuff? I agree. And I almost, and I've said this before, I was like, you know, your, your, your windup is another pitch, right? You know, your windup can be, you know, your, whatever i don't even know what you would call it like here's a curveball here's a here's a slide step curveball here's a quick pitch curveball here's a quick pitch fastball a quick pitch whatever quick pitch knuckleball i don't know um but you can throw whatever it is that you feel confident in and i've and i've said this before is that i would rather have a guy throw the wrong pitch in the situation that he's 100 percent convicted in than the right pitch that he's 80 percent convicted in because you know, the conviction part of it is, is a hundred percent of it. And, you know, it's not so much about what pitch the piece of paper says that you should throw. It's about the conviction of the player that's going to get the hitter to, you know, induce a swing that's going to benefit the team that the pitcher's on. So, um, you know, the creativity side of it is something that I absolutely encourage and, and, and want everybody to, to continue to, to work on. And then, uh, you know, there's, there's all different ways to do it. Like you were saying, you know, from the, from, from, from your windup, from, from your stretch, um, you know, speed, you know, quick pitch, slow pitch. I love watching guys like Johnny Cueto pitch, you know, as goofy as it is sometimes. And, and that was one of the funnest games that I've ever had was pitching against him when he was with the Giants. Um, I think it was either my first or second game after I came over with, uh, from Oakland to to the Dodgers and we were playing at Dodger Stadium and we were just you know it was just, it was just a lot of fun because you know the creativity from both sides was was at a was at a very high level um, and again the one thing and I'll say this I remember coming back after 2007 I had a good year I think I threw around 200 innings with the Cubs and I remember coming back and having a meeting in spring training and they were telling me that, you know, hey, you know, you threw 68% fastballs last year. We need you to throw around 70 or 71% fastballs. Now, today, fast forward, uh, I don't even know how many, 13, 14 years, that is off the table. <laughs> you know, now you're, now you're seeing guys throw, hey, you need a 50-50 split because your secondary pitch is, is excellent or, you know, you know, or, or whatever, or flip it. You know, you maybe you have a excellent fastball that plays plays up or plays true or whatever it might be but it's not encouraged to um you know fit into a mold anymore it's just not molding pitching is not that cookie cutter like like you were saying it's it's totally 
it's totally the, the whole the whole game has changed the outlier is the one that they want they want somebody with it off the charts curve or a devin williams change up where it's just moving just off the, that hitters don't see often so they they can just dominate them with that pitch right yeah and that the, so that's the other side too is that there is there's still a balance i believe there's still a balance because i think that um you know exposing a certain pitch too much you know these guys are the best hitters in the world too so that they you know their eyes are are, are extremely good and they're going to make an adjustment as well and i think that's one thing that you see um with guys going into maybe a sophomore slump after a great first year in the big leagues where they say like wow i can't believe how you know what well, how come i'm having such a tough year this year and it's like well you know they're the best players in the world and they're going to make adjustments to you. So that's where, you know, now, now you see how good guys really are. So speaking of outliers, your curveball is an outlier to me. I mean, everybody loves seeing it. Um, it is, it, it's one of the best pitches in the game. How do you grip it? What advice can you give uh, to younger players learning? Did you throw it when you were young? Um, just little things like that that might help. Yeah. Well, I didn't start throwing uh, my curveball until I was 17, 16, really? 17. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it was, you know, probably, uh, I think that was sophomore year in, in high school. Um, so I, I guess now, you know, even, even my son will ask me, you know, Hey, how do you throw a curveball or whatever? And I'm like, I, you know, <laughs> you're not throwing any curveballs right now. So, uh, you know, for me, it was just something that, um, somewhat came naturally to be able to spin a baseball. Um, I worked uh, with my brother who, who he had a, he had a good curveball himself, but he was right-handed um, and uh, you know, played college baseball and understood, you know, the, the, the realm of pitching, so to speak. Um, and, you know, just continued to keep working on it over the years, but didn't really get a feel for it and understand um I guess the the different shapes of the breaking ball until I started talking to uh, Brian Bannister uh, when I was with with the Red Sox in in 2015, and we had a conversation uh, in 2015 that you know opened up this kind of box of creativity, if you want to call it. Um, and he said, you know, would you ever think about changing the shape? of your breaking ball and for some reason the word shape just you know again set off this creativity um kind of environment for me where i was like okay i can you know spin it here 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 and i can try all these different things and you're saying okay this is what i should do or not not necessarily but i had you know the conviction behind it at that point finding kind of refinding myself an independent ball and then taking that to Pawtucket and AAA and then getting the opportunity to do it that season for four games in September um, with the Red Sox. But that conversation that we had kicked off even more, you know, to the next level of how I could use my curveball. So I started, you know, messing around with just different points of how the ball can come off my finger. Uh, where can I you know, accelerate the spin, where can I decelerate the spin? How can, um, you know, different, again, shapes or arcs or how can, you know, how many different ways can I spin this thing? And I'm just gonna keep doing it and, and try to figure out, can I go underneath? Can I have it come from the bottom and go up? Um, and uh, just, you know, yeah, really try to expand on it as much as I could. Um, for the grip, I, I will change my my grip. It's 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 a little bit. I used to throw it with uh, the horseshoe. Can you guys can you see that? So with the horseshoe facing towards my my fingers. So I used to throw it like that, right? Um, but now I throw it with the the horseshoe facing away, and the reason being um, is because if you look at the seams the seams it, it it goes it comes it it has like the appearance that it comes up right as opposed to the other way if i had it here it almost goes it, it gets that feeling like it's going down so uh having the ball it just feels like i get my fingertip on that on that little upswing of the of the seams 
Did you always have your, did you always have your thumb there, Rich? That was a huge adjustment that I made. Um, yeah. I, I was a with, with the horseshoe. Okay. Guy, right. Yep. Yep. Here. But I made a big adjustment in the minor leagues. I was kind of always on the seam. Yep. Moving that thumb up on top of the seam was a huge help for me. Okay. Uh, felt okay. like I had a little more ball to pull. Yeah. And, and it came out shorter. You know, you bounce a bunch of them when you're getting used to it. But sure, it yeah. ended up my, my breaking ball ended up being a better pitch for me down the road. It, it, as I progressed in the big leagues, my curveball was probably better, you know, years six through ten than it was yeah. early in my career. But it, yeah. did you always have your thumb on top? Because I noticed yours is on top of the scene. Yeah, so I didn't even really – I didn't – you know, it's funny because I think – with um yeah I never really thought about my thumb to be honest with you I guess I've maybe I've always had it in there in that range but uh it I I try not to try not to move it too much I try to keep it generally in that area yeah I, you know so yeah that's a good point though I mean because if you have your thumb too far on the side you know you're not going to get enough uh pressure yeah. from underneath to be yeah. able to have because it's almost like these two fingers here your your middle finger and your thumb are creating that that pressure right to be able to have the ball spin the way you want it to so uh if you move your thumb up now your now your pressure points are changing it's almost like it's going to squeeze out a little bit backwards instead of instead of trying to have it you know exactly yeah flip out that way um yeah no that's that's so that's a great point um and you know one thing i will do i guess is is if we look at you know, if I can do this, <laughs> if you can see my fingers here, because yeah. there's a space in between. Yep. So I'll, I'll adjust sometimes. I'll just like, I'll come back out here, <clears throat> you know, and then I, and I'll, or I'll kind of choke it sometimes. And that's just the change again. You know, if I want it to come out more straight and then down, you know, appears here is the fastball. So, so for me, like one of the things is, is that, and, and to, um, if kids are listening out there is don't get discouraged. If your ball, if you have good spin, if you have good spin and your ball pops up, don't, don't, don't be discouraged by that and think like, Oh, that's a terrible curveball because there's still a top part of the strike zone that has to be, you know, and I think that's something we always talk about, Oh, pitch at the knees, pitch at the knees, pitch at the knees. But what about pitching at the top of the strike zone? You can steal strikes at the top. It's almost like as it appears as a ball and then it comes down and it catches the top of the strike zone. I think at some point, you know, in, in probably not the too near near too future near, the near future, uh, we're going to have uh, an automated strike zone. So if if that ends up getting implemented, the top of the strike zone is going to be a huge, um, you know, almost another wave of of teaching. So, but my point is, is that if you are throwing balls at the, you know, that are kind of popping up. Uh, don't think, oh gosh, I got to change all these things to be able to get the ball down. There's just a few things that you probably have to do to be able to do that. But you know, the top, the top part of the strike zone is huge, especially for you know guys that have the true uh, you know 12 to six or maybe 11 to five spin because your fastball is going to play up there on the in the top part of the zone as well. So um, your, yeah, Cubs, really, your Cubs yeah. curveball was a your Cubs curveball was more of a pop out up and down. Yeah. Yeah, it was. And then as yeah. you've manipulated over the years, you've learned the other ways to do it. I, mine was kind of an up and down as well. But man, you yeah. got me. You got me thinking about all these different things now. I'm wanting to go out and throw. <laughs> 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 but yeah, the uh, it is. It, so that was you know kind of the when I started feeling where I needed to have the release point of my curveball, and then then from there you can change the shapes and then from your release point to be able to manipulate the ball how you want to, then you can change your release point. So it's kind of like you find your release point. Okay. I got one thing down and I have a curveball that I can throw for a strike whenever I want at any time that I want. Uh, and now I can mess with, you know, the angle and the shape of it and maybe possibly, you know, your arm angle, so you start changing your arm angle a little bit, but so now you do that. And then when you start changing your release points, then you can change the speed of it. When you change the speed of it, you can change, you know, wherever you want to throw it in all four quadrants of the strike zone, front of the strike zone, back of the strike zone, um, top of the strike zone. And, and 
The other thing that I'll mention is that the appearance of having the curveball as a strike now and you know fall on top of the plate is 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 so so important. Um, you know, it's one thing that I'm starting to actually do a better job at than I than I ever have before. I always had a little bit of a, a difficult time bouncing it, uh, bouncing the curveball. Um, I always threw it, you know, either up in the zone or for a strike. Uh, but now I'm starting to figure out little things that I can do to, uh, you know, I remember throwing clearly throwing a, a curveball this year to Yachty or Molina, and it was it was a strike all the way, and it never got there, and it just fell right on on the top part of the plate. And I got him to, you know, hit a weak ground ball to, to third base. Um, but again, playing with the depth perception of the hitter's eyes is is a huge, uh, huge benefit to, to you know, for for any pitch, curveball, changeup, you know, fastball, being able to feel your feel your hand speed out front to accelerate the fastball, or maybe decelerate the fastball a little bit. So you're changing spin rates, you're changing how the ball perceives comes out of your hand to the hitter, and it's it, all these things of have uh, for me have come around the last five years I had you know before that I feel like I had no idea how to pitch <laughs> <laughs> I think we all go through that at some point yeah yeah so, yeah. so this, this year in Minnesota so you you end up uh sign a one-year deal with the twins yeah. end up in Minnesota um definitely a fun batting practice to watch right probably look like yeah. top golf when you get yeah. you're standing back there <laughs> watching these guys take bp yeah um yeah. you guys obviously we had a great you know great shortened yeah. season uh you yeah. did really well and yeah. yeah and then you know you don't end up where you want to um, right tell, tell us a little bit about rob and i were talking we thought it'd be interesting to hear um since you ended up with uh, kenta maeda there again if you had any fun, yeah. fun stories with him or uh, usually the fun stories come with their translators more than they do the actual yeah, exactly, the, the yeah. Japanese guys are your teammates, but anything yeah. fun with him? Oh uh, yeah. He, you know, the one thing that I will say is that like what the, what I saw in LA and then what I saw is from a pitching standpoint is I, and I'm going to say this now with a full season next year, he is one of my favorites to win the Cy Young in the American league. And the reason why I'm saying that is because he is completely, you know, almost reinvented himself with the same pitches that he throws but he's you know he's doing something and I'm not gonna you know not that I'm gonna give it away or anything like that but what he's doing is 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 something that he wasn't doing in LA and now that he's doing it in Minnesota uh his ability and his pitch ability has gone through the roof um so you know I I told him that at the end of the year I said I can't wait to see what you can do in in a in a full season it's gonna be it's gonna be a lot of fun um, but yeah, he's, he's a lot of fun to be around and, um, you know, very routine oriented as, as a lot of guys are. Um, and you know, his, his translators are, are great. Two guys that he has, he is a, a massage therapist, uh, there and, and his translator and they're both, uh, they're very funny. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. <laughs> He was so much fun to watch this year with that split change and the slider yeah. just going. Uh, he was able to tunnel yeah. him right down the middle and have him go either right. direction. You couldn't pick it up. I right. mean, clear hitters had a hard time with that. Yeah, absolutely. And especially, you know, with the way he was doing it to, to uh, both sides of the plate. And, and, you know, it didn't matter if it was a lefty up or a righty. Um, just the conviction that he had behind, you know, every pitch and, and the way he took, you know, his ability um, – that he showed in the eighth inning in the playoffs and took that into, you know, starting. So it was like, okay, I'm coming in in the eighth inning in the playoffs. I'm going to unload my tank. And then now as a starter, it's like, oh, wow, I can do this over an extended period of time. That's one of the things that, that I find, uh, uh, you know, very interesting too for pitchers is like, you know, if, if you can do it for one inning, who's telling you that you can't do it for six or seven? You know, we don't know until, you know, you actually get the opportunity to either a go back and and see what a sample size of a one inning looks like, and then and then go back into a starting role and say, okay, now I have the idea of what it takes, and I can do this over a prolonged period of time. Um, it's it's just an interesting little insight that I that I saw uh, from them. But yeah, this year was it was a good year. I had a had surgery uh, probably well be about a year ago today or somewhere around here uh and and came back 
uh, this year, which was, you know, very exciting. And I think it's something that, um, you know, more pitchers are possibly going to be open to the idea of having this primary repair surgery that could, you know, really shorten the recovery time for for guys uh, who are looking down the barrel of of Tommy John. Uh, I think it's something that, you know, for me, we, I only can speak to what I've been through, and and it was it was uh, amazing. So, uh, and it, and the the recovery time was only, you know, I was back on the mound. I think in four months or five months. Wow. And uh, pitching in pitching, you know, in simulated games at six months due to uh, due to COVID this year. Wow! And my son's just recovering from surgery. He had shoulder surgery, and uh, it's 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 tough. Shoulder surgery yeah. is, is is not a lot of fun. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a tough one. I yeah. you know, I encourage the uh, the strengthening. I don't need to tell you, but the strengthening yeah. program is uh, is so vital. Let's uh, let's let's cover what what everyone out there in the in the twitter verse wants to talk about which is dick mountain let's talk about the <laughs> let's talk about the nickname because you know we we in chicago knee is dick hill yeah. um, but then but then dick mountain comes along during players weekend and uh, yep. give, me, give, give us a you know a quick rundown of how that came about and and the little story behind it all right so uh in 2015 uh alex hassan um uh brock holt uh mookie betts this this might actually been in in, uh, no no that that was in 15 and those guys were uh alex hassan actually started calling me mountain he started calling me mountain so i was like what okay (laughs) so he's like yeah dick mountain so that was that was where that it just caught on and and uh you know, those guys kind of coined the, coined the nickname. So it stuck with me. And then players weekend came around and, you know, mulling over what we should put on the back of the Jersey and said, what the, what the hell Dick mountain sounds good. Let's do it. <laughs> so and then I end up pitching that weekend and I'm like, I got D mountain on my back. I'm like, Oh boy, this is <laughs> so great. It is really, it's one of my favorites. It's one of my favorites. Well, the, the funny thing is every time I tweet it out, I'll tweet you out under Dick mountain and, and probably 50% of people think there's really a pitcher named Dick mountain. And they're like, that's the best name ever. And I'm like, <laughs> and it takes them a while to figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. It goes back to our old uh, goes back to our old bench coach right in Chicago Dick Pole. So, yeah, Dick Pole, yeah. Yeah, 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 we had another. We had, yeah. we had some good ones, but uh, right. all right. So um, one last thing I wanted to cover on the baseball end, and then we'll talk some quick World Series. But take me through the game that I happen to flip on uh, just by accident as I'm flipping games. You go perfect game into the ninth against Pittsburgh. You go perfect game into yeah. the ninth no hitter into the 10th and you go back out there. So it was like, uh, um, I, I think there was a, a fishy play if I remember correct, right. That they, that ended up being an error that, that broke up the perfect game in the ninth. Right. Yeah. Logan Forsyth. I felt, I mean, I, you know, I said, don't worry. You know, I really, he felt really heavy about that play too. And I was like, Oh man, don't even, you know, it's, it, and, and, and he's, he's a great friend. And just, you know, when, when you have a group of guys that are behind you and everybody, you know, is, is again, pulling the same rope or wh- however you want to say it is, is, uh, you know, on the same page. It's, it's just, it's an incredible, and you know, it's an incredible environment, a great feeling to have. And, um, yeah, so I go back out there for the 10th and, and Josh Harrison, uh, clipped me for, for a solo Homer. And that was it. <laughs> I, can't, I, I can't imagine. I mean, how, what, what did you feel like, honestly, after that? I mean, it had to be an incredible letdown to, to go that deep into it furthest I'd ever gone in a big league game was perfect through six. And I went out yeah. for the seventh and I felt so much pressure walking out there for the seventh. I can't imagine what you felt like in the ninth and then going back out in the 10th. Yeah, it was just, uh, you know, I felt it's just one of those feelings where you, you hear it from, from other guys or whoever, you know, you feel locked in and just, and, and you're in attack, you know, you're, I'm constantly in attack mode, but that day it was like, you know, every ball came out of my hand. You know, I felt like I was, you know, throwing a hundred miles an hour and, 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 uh, you know, the curve ball just had some extra spin on it or something. It was just, uh, it was a great feeling and, you know, fell short, but, uh, a really good memory nonetheless. That's awesome. It was fun to watch. Uh, it was. Yeah. Watch. Yep. yeah. 
So uh, let's chat World Series for a little bit before we wrap it up. Uh, Dodgers up 1-0. Um, yeah. As you mentioned earlier, you feel like uh, this is their year to wrap it up. I mean, their lineup is deep. So how, how much have you been watching, and how much did you see the Rays line up during the season? Yeah, I didn't really get the chance to see the Rays uh, that much, except for, you know, a couple of the playoff games. And, and what they did, I think, with the Yankees and the way that they handled, you know, their their pitching staff, I, I thought was very impressive. Um, and I think that's where, you know, you can have uh, – it's it just – it's it's really, in, in my feeling, in, in the World Series is, again, and, and in the playoffs is the team that makes the least mistakes is going to win. Um and that's where I think with Kevin Cash and, and you know, the, the front office of Tampa orchestrating that, that, you know, that roster and putting those certain guys in place uh, is no, you know, by no mistake that they're, they're where they are right now. Um, and I think when you look at their pitching, uh, that's going to be their, their biggest uh, attribute and, and the guys that they have coming up next. Uh, Morton, is Morton starting tonight? Or it might be Snell tonight. Yeah, Snell. Yeah, so you got Snell and you got and you got Morton. So you have two really tough pitchers uh, that the Dodgers are going to have to navigate through. But also, you know, they have to face Dustin May and Walker Bueller. So um, tonight's going to be interesting. I believe Dustin May is starting. Is that is that right? I think I think he is. But uh, you know, if he if he's starting tonight, uh, you know, and and uh, or Gonsolin, Gonsolin. Gonsolin possibly Gonsolin tonight. Yeah, they got they they're they're very deep. They have you know, and I and I and I always you know, I, Dustin May is going to be a great pitcher. I believe he's got great stuff. Um, but I always I always thought you know Tony had um, four pitches that he could throw for strikes. He has the pitchability. Um, you know, he's he's just a little bit more ahead of the curve, I think, um, than than Dustin just at this point. Um, but I love. You know Dustin's fastball and his ability to to throw that cutter slider, if you want to call it, um, uh, in on on lefties and away from righties. So, uh, and again, we'll see if it comes to as it has. A couple of these games have just come down to the bullpens, and uh, a lot of that we don't know what goes on behind the scenes right now uh, with with who's feeling good, who's not feeling that good. So, um, but usually, you know, when when it comes down to the final final series of the year the world series uh everybody's feeling they'll, they'll find a way <laughs> yeah some guys have been exposed you know as far as, yeah. as um being tired i mean the bullpens have gotten worn out in every series yeah. so yeah. i mean it's unlike we've probably ever seen before so what what have you seen rob Oh, I was going to say, um, one of the things that i noticed is walker bueller gave you a shout out as someone that helped him through his blister issue and was kind of curious as to uh what advice you might have given him and how that relationship is. Cause he was spoke very highly of you. Yeah. Walker's a uh, incredible friend. Um, love the guy. He's uh, you know, he's, we've, we've uh, you know, through our time together in LA have just uh, you know, became a great friendship. And um, the first time he got called up, his locker was next to mine and, you know, just, yeah, you know, haven't seen him from his first time in the big leagues to where he is now. It's, you know, it's no surprise. Um, but seeing he, he took some, you know, ups and downs his first year and, you know, we had some good talks and some really good conversations just, to, you know, as, as Glenn and I did when, when, when I first came up. So it's just something, um, you know, that I, that, you know, that friendship kind of grew over the, the years that we were in LA together. And, you know, I just told him, uh, make sure you keep your, be, you know, your fingers covered and, and when you throw, uh, every day and don't stop throwing. Um, I think that's the biggest and, and most important point that anybody who's going through blister issues uh, must do is that, you know, make sure and that, and you don't just cover your finger with a Band-Aid because that's going to rip off easily. You got to, you know, really tape it up uh, almost where it just doesn't feel right, uh, but you're, you're moving your arm. So as long as you're getting your throwing in and you're, and you're, and you're, you know, basically exercising your arm, uh, that's the most important thing that you can do through you know, downtime when you had, when you were waiting for this blister to heal. And that's the, that's the other thing that I told him was that just, unfortunately it's a time thing. There's no magic, you know, silver bullet that will, 
make it make it feel better um and also you know some laser they've you know there's a couple of treatments that you can do with lasers and stuff like that that will maybe assist in healing the skin and bring more blood flow to the area to create uh, you know that new skin to to heal a little bit better and, and possibly a little bit faster but um from my experience with blisters is that you know unfortunately it is a time thing and and uh you know that that's really what i told them yeah, I mean, as far as what I see, I, I think uh, both of these teams pitching wise are 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 loaded. I enjoy watching watching both sides. I mean, it's it's a great matchup. Uh, Ray's bullpen is so deep with so many different arms. Uh, I love watching Dustin May. Um, I think yeah. his stuff is just things you don't see yeah. every day. Yeah, no, uh, <laughs> yeah. hundred one yeah, mile an hour sinkers and stuff. It's crazy. Yeah, and then you know coming at you with legs and arms and. <laughs> You know, you're like, where's the ball coming? Oh, there it is. It's too late. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that, uh, I, you know, and I talked to Pryor about that rotation. He was, he, you know, it's such a, you know, it's really a wide array of different pitchers, but he said that those young guys are so good and, yeah. and, and very polished, you know, for where they're at in their careers and their ages. And he said for him, it's been a relatively easy road this first year as a pitching coach, which, which yeah. says a lot about those guys. Um, so let's let's finish as uh, I'm I'm your pseudo agent for um, 2021. Uh, I put together a couple goals for you that should be pretty achievable, and 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 I have a destination which only makes sense that you sign with the Rockies because Dick <laughs> Mountain has to pitch for the Rockies at some point in his career, yep. right? Even though yeah. it's not a pitcher's destination, Ooh, but it's okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna <laughs> have to do a Ron our test and change my name if I go there. <laughs> So, so we have two, I, I always love putting together in the interviews I've been doing, I put together something kind of uh, off the wall that we have in common and you, you'll never guess this, but we are stuck together on 67 career major league victories. So your goal, so your goal in 2021 is to win one game Get one. Get one. <laughs> right? and, and you need to win, you need to add on, tack on 54 punch outs to, to take over uh, in career punches. So okay. two goals is easily achievable. Um, yeah. I know the Rockies thing is probably not realistic, but uh, best of luck, man, wherever you yeah, end up. Yeah. I mean, we're all going to be watching. You'll be pitching this year as a, as 2021 as a 41 year old. 41. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can't believe it. Yeah, it's crazy when when I think back. It's like, yeah, you're gonna be pitching when you're 41. I was like, well, I, you know, I didn't see that, but yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be fun. I'm excited. It's awesome, Rob. You got yeah. anything to close? Yeah, I, I actually, that's a great point. And and one thing that came up as we were talking about all this, the cold weather aspects of it. Is there part of it being a cold weather pitcher that maybe you had less mileage on you when you were younger that somehow extended your career? Or is that just a made up thing that I just came up with? And I didn't well, come up with it. Other people have said that too. Well, yeah. And I didn't come up with this either, but I think that like that 10,000 hour kind of, you know, rule or whatever, you know, from, uh, uh, is it Malcolm Gladwell? Did he say yep. that 10,000 yep. hour? So, yep. um, you know, that theory, I believe has a lot of truth to it. And I think that, you know, maybe uh, to get to the finished product or, you know, you're never really finished, I guess, you're always learning, but a polished, a much more polished stone would be uh, the ability to get to that 10,000 hours within, you know, a time for because you hear about kids now injuries are going up and through the roof and through the roof and through the roof and you know where is that coming from is it coming from the the you know professionalization of amateur sports where it's like hey you could you got to pick a sport now like if, for, for example i know i'm going off uh, you know on a tangent here but my son's playing hockey right now and i was talking to a friend of mine who was saying you know he wants to try try goalie and he's nine, he's nine years old. He's nine years old. Okay. And he tells me this, he goes, well, you know, he has to pick now. And I said, what? He has to pick now. Yeah. Because that's going to be his position. I was like, all right, this is, I don't even know. Where's the, you know, like, I was like, that's ridiculous. I go, that's so, that's so, it's so stupid. <laughs> it really is. It's like that, that doesn't make any sense to me. You can't tell me that somebody is going to be X or has to do this. Um, and you're going to shoehorn, you know, or put a, put a kid in a spot that they can't, 
you know, grow or try to, you know, how many guys have we seen that's come up as shortstops end up in center field or left field or right field or end up being a utility guy or a pitcher. <laughs> um, but so, you know, I think that there is a sweet spot in there. I don't know what that is. Uh, but I, again, back to our original point early on in the interview is that I think kids should try as many sports as they can. Um, and then, yes, there is a point, you know, in everybody's uh, career uh, or, you know, whatever that you have to start kind of focusing in on, on that sport that you want to be, you know, proficient in. And I think that some find that at a, at an earlier age than others, but um, you know, I don't, I don't know if, if the, the, longevity because I've had now two elbow surgeries and a shoulder surgery, you know, really prolongs anything to being in the Northeast. Um, so I think that, you know, it's really uh, a product of, of pitching is that injuries will happen. Um, and when they do happen, be patient. Uh, you're going to get through it, put in the time and the effort to, to rehab and make sure that, you know, you do all the little things, the tedious exercises, and, and uh, you're going to be better off on the, on the other end. Yeah, those, are the, those are the dads that I'm always making fun of when I tell their <laughs> – so whenever the catchers come out, and I make fun of the catchers all the time, you know that, Rich. And yeah. I say, I, I, especially the high school age ones, I'm like, dude, blame it on your dad. He's the one who bought you all that gear when you're like eight or nine and made you a catcher. <laughs> it's his fault. So, yeah, those are yeah. the same, uh, same hockey dads. But yeah. Yeah. yeah th thanks again for joining us. I'm going to let you yeah. go because we've been on here for a while, man. It was awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Glenn. And thank you, Rob. I appreciate thank it. You. Thank you for having me on and uh, I'll, I'll be following you guys. I got to get on that. Uh, what is it? Twitter? Twitter. <laughs> We're going to do it. Hey, uh, 2021 guys follow Dick Mountain on Twitter <laughs> in 2021. And uh, thanks Rich for joining us. And thank you, Rob. You're awesome. Thanks for uh, coming on again and fo follow Rob's YouTube page um, at the Pitching Ninja or on Twitter. And thanks for joining us on the Rush Hour, and we'll see you next time.